Welcome to the weekly, a podcast brought to you by Calvary Bible Church. I got Zach and Thomas in the booth with me. I'm with your host, Pasta Jay. That is a pasta, not a pastor, Jay. But you're also a pastor, which is just so amazing. And these two yahoos are supposed to introduce the weekly, and they failed to do it today. Jay. We actually had a hit record. No, may this be the official... What what episode are we on? 400? 49. 49. So we're getting close. We've had 2,500 downloads of The Weekly here at Calvary Bible Church. Man. How cool is that? It's pretty that's, awesome. That's really yeah. cool. You know what also is really cool? And, and uh, I think our communication team would really appreciate this. Yeah. I have a new way of receiving this podcast now. Oh. Uh, so I downloaded the Thornton-specific uh, podcast... Uh, mostly just, I love the sound of my own voice, so I just listen to my <laughs> own sermons constantly. Yeah, Zach. Uh, no, that's actually not true at all. Uh, uh, but the weekly shows up in that as well. So, uh, yeah, uh, yeah I, I get the weekly twice now. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Very cool. So each campus has yeah. its own podcast that they can grab. They can listen to the sermons from that campus. This is a great segue. Pause yes, right there. That's why I did it. Okay, this is a great segue. You can also go to calvarybible.com, and now you can select your campus at calvarybible.com so you get the right information about what campus you attend here at Calvary Bible Church. Also, if you go to calvarybible.com slash events, you're going to click on your campus to find out what is happening at your campus local for you and guess what's happening at all three campuses starting point is happening this fall so you want to sign up to starting point it's a great place to start here at calvary to meet the staff the staff to meet you we provide lunch child care it's a great hour of your week and our week when we get to hang out together so go to calvarybible.com slash event pick your campus sign up for starting point we would love to see you there if you're new to calvary Also, if you've been around Calvary a long time, you know something big is in the works these days. We have a new church app. Our online giving has switched. Comps team's going to buy us coffee this week. Yeah. We're like rocking it. I don't know if it's just y'all two are in the booth and I'm just like feeling it. But okay. Anyways, you can go to calvarybible.com slash the, let me look, let me look, let me look. You can also go to the front page of Mm calvarybible.com to find the new app. But it is called... Church Center, and you can go to calvarybible.com slash church center. I want to give you the right place to download the app today and set up your online giving. Also, receive texts and alerts from your life group and your community. Find groups and Bible studies there. It's a pretty cool app. It's going to be great. really fun. So yeah. this this fall, Church Center, download the app today, and that is all my announcements this All week. kinds of new things. Mm-hmm. You can now get the the sermon from your campus. And, and that's, Thomas, I'm sure you get this all the time. Like, I love the online, but I wish I could hear this sermon from you. And, and like, I, I hear it like, oh, man, Zach, where was the most recent sermon that you had? Because I love hearing those sermons. And now I get to send them to them. It's like, oh, wait, you're Zach? I thought I meant Thomas. Can you yeah. send me Thomas's <laughs> message? And now I can do that. I can send people Thomas's message. It's fantastic. I had an awkward exchange out in public the other day, and I think they thought I was Thomas from a distance. Mm. And I was, they're like, hey, Thomas! I, I raised my head like, where's Thomas? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, I'll just wave. They walked by. I think, I like, do you think okay. just like all bald people look the same? <laughs> no, I do not. <laughs> I hope not. Not all of them look like Brad Pitt. Is Brad Pitt bald? No, he's not. Yeah. yeah I totally. think we look like Bruce Willis or... <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah. anyways. That's anyway, really funny. all right. <laughs> hey, we're in a great new series here at Calvary. Um, if you have been on campus or online this last week, you found out that we are in the series called Greater Than. It is an exploration into the book of Hebrews, and um, what a fun book. Yeah, it's great. Uh, so good to, to jump into it. And in, in the first handful of verses that we had, we were in... Uh, chapter one, verses one through four. And and really just one of the things that's most striking about it is just the beauty of the passage. And we get that as we read through it, it has such a a sweet flow to it. Uh, It has has that, it, I don't know if it recalls some of your, your childhood stories that you had, but long ago at many times in many ways, like, like it has this, this, like, I don't know, this, this majesticness to it that that's so good. Uh, that I just love. The, the passage is so beautiful. 
Yeah, so Thomas mentioned this, and he referenced Star Wars. Oh, great. Which yeah. was great. Yeah. Oh, I should have actually listened to that sermon that I'm sending to people. Now. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's it's not a... Anyways, go on. You had the best language. Go for it. No, I don't know if I have any great language for it. But you're right, Zach. It just opens up and it just draws you in immediately, right? Mm-hmm. Like You immediately know that whoever wrote the book of Hebrews is a masterful artist to start off. I mean, the English only captures part of it, but just the long ago at many times in many ways. Yeah. The Lord, yeah. And this is what's great about is we have really good English Bibles that we can trust and know that what is recorded here is what God has spoken through the authors. Uh, and most of the time, like we, we can get that really good. And I think this is one of those cases we can get the beauty of this passage really well. And yet we're also missing just a little bit, just a little bit of that beauty and the artfulness that is going into this with, with just uh, the English, uh, with that long ago at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. It's beautiful as it's written. Uh, one of the things that we miss is there's some intentional alliteration in this passage in, in the original language. Uh, I think there's about 12 words that make that up in, in the Greek. And uh, five of them start with this P, so uh, a, a word that starts with P. And so we get the beauty of it in English, and yet there is more structure and more care that's put into it than, than we even realize. Like, this is such an artful introduction to it. And, and it sets itself well for how well Hebrews is written. It is, it is a piece of literature to be reckoned with, for sure. Yeah, so there's other books of the Bible that sort of have these artful entry points as well the one off the top of my head easily is john mm-hmm. you know um where else do you see sort of these artful entries into the god story well i think the immediate one is genesis oh um, yeah in connection with That's the right. hebrews and i know we were joking about star wars and that was kind of the point was you open this up and it it sounds like in a galaxy far far away yeah and that's not what it's about like it's actually when did the lord first speak so if it's long ago when did he first speak and spoke Genesis 1, mm-hmm. right? So creation came into existence because God spoke. So his words brought about the earth that we inhabit, the life that we inhabit. And so God's not speaking in a galaxy far, far away, long, long ago, but he is speaking into the world in which we inhabit, that we live, that we experience, that we suffer in. And that's going to be this message of Hebrews, that God himself is in the story that we are in, um, in a greater way that he's above our sufferings and he's above our sins. He's above all of these things. There's nothing greater than Jesus. So long ago, from the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And so I think this is an immediate link to God is a speaking God. He has been mm-hmm. speaking from the very first moment on the pages of the Bible, and he is speaking today through his son. So we should find comfort then, is it what you're saying, and encouragement and joy knowing that God is speaking today. Yeah, and a great confidence that what he has to say not only reveals who he is to us, but it's actually going to matter to our life. Like this isn't just a deposit of spiritual sayings that just came down from heaven, but he's going to speak about what does it really mean to be human? What does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman? What does it mean to be married? What about finances? What about forgiveness? What about generosity? What about racial reconciliation? What about the nations? Like he's going to speak into all the things that we want him to speak into. Yeah. That's really cool, man. Yeah, that's so, great. I love when we talk about that stuff. So cool. But what is missing from this section? So we get this beautiful oh. introduction, but what do we not have in this introduction? That's a great segue. You're you're on point today. And you I are. only have good segues. I wish you would realize. <laughs> yeah. It's it 15,000 points for segues. <laughs> yeah, what Kristen mocks me because I'm like, that was really funny. She's like, you say that often. Like, yeah. you don't believe I'm funny. <laughs> I don't know what's missing, but I think I would like to know who wrote the book. Mm. Yeah, so why? <laughs> <laughs> That's it. So Hebrews is a book that does not have an author attached to it. So explain sort of why that possibly is and what are some of the implications for us to like trust this book and know that it's a valid book to be in our Bible. Yeah. And I, and I think it's 
pertinent for our, our times now to where it is really easy to say things anonymously and we're kind of taught the dangers of that. Uh, we can hop online and we can find views on everything. Um, and a lot of that is, is easy to send out. And there's always that discussion of we operate in different ways when we can be anonymous than when we're in front of people. Uh, and, and so there could be a fear for this. And certainly as you look throughout church history, like there are those who turn to Hebrews and say, it doesn't say who it is written by. And so I have a difficult time of trusting it. Uh, and, and even in the earliest church, uh, the, the days of the earliest church, they used this book. They saw that God was speaking through it, but there was still just a little bit of hesitancy. It was really early on that it was said, this is canon, this is God's word, this belongs to the Bible. But for a little bit, there was, we're going to use it, but we're just going to keep it slightly at an arm's distance um, before recognizing, like, well, the church has used this book uh, in the way that they use other New Testament books and exclusively how they use other New Testament books. And, and that's really important. Like this isn't uh, some other book that's found and oh, maybe this should be in the Bible. Like we don't know who wrote it just like we don't know who wrote Hebrew. So why do we trust one over than the other? It's well because of uh, how the church has used it before. And a really important piece is, as Thomas, you were saying earlier, what we find in it. Yeah. I think that the key word you used is what the church recognized, mm -hmm. right? So many people think that there's like this Da Vinci Code selection of all these books that were available and people chose which books to put in and which books to keep out. And this is not the case. It's, there's, there's a body, right? there's a canon that seems to be traveling together and which is recognized as apostolic, um, having its proximity to Jesus, having its proximity to uh, the apostles, um, how they've been treated and used. I think the other piece that you point out, Zach, is what's in the book. Mm. Um, if you lost Hebrews, do you lose the whole story of Jesus? Like, no, not at all. How many references to the Old Testament are in the book of Hebrews? Uh, 7,943. <laughs> it's like, and we're, going through, and we're going through each one on Sunday. Yeah. So get excited. Uh, that, and to clarify, that's an approximate number. <laughs> <laughs> that's plus or minus. How you count. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it, it's really just trying to unpack something for us. And so... Um, if you lost it, you might lose some clarity, mm -hmm. but you don't lose the content. Like there's more that's covered in the epistles and the gospels and um, throughout the whole Old Testament of who this Jesus is. Mm. So the author of Hebrews is, is really a brilliant individual that's drawing out from the Old Testament these truths. As not, it's not as though he's bringing new truths to light and that we wouldn't have unless we had the book of Hebrews. Yeah, yeah, and so... That was what the hesitancy was. They trusted the content. They knew it aligned with all else that God had spoken. Uh, they knew it was closely associated with uh, an apostle, either directly, so if it was Paul or someone associated with Paul. And that's the criteria that they wanted to use with it. Is this coming directly from someone who knew Jesus or someone close enough to have their teaching? So like Jude, the book of Jude we have, he wasn't an apostle, but it was closely connected to them. And so we could trust that one. As this was being revealed, even though we didn't know exactly who it came from, we could trust that it had that apostolic connection that you were doing. And so therefore we could trust and learn from the book of Hebrews as the church has been doing and has always been doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Top three candidates, church history for authorship are probably Paul, mm -hmm. Apollos, Barnabas. If we're just sticking to three, yes. Yeah. If we are widening it, let's, we let's could, do top 100. Okay, because uh, we could probably go wider <laughs> than that too. There are a lot of thoughts as to who wrote this. And, and what we find as we read through it, uh, as, as we talked about, the, the Greek is really eloquent and really elegant. Uh, so it, there are some words that we find in here that we don't find anywhere else in the New Testament. Uh, and, and that shows the artfulness of it, uh, but also the uniqueness of it to where, like, yeah, Paul had a good handle of the Greek. At times, it seems to go past that. The argument then is, like, is he using uh, someone to write, which seems clear that he does elsewhere, and this person has a better grasp of Greek. Could could be that. Could be that. And it is also a, a tremendous understanding of the Old Testament with those 7,943 approximate Old Testament quotations. So someone who uh, is, is balancing both those and seems to be writing to a group that would have 
an understanding of Greek culture and an understanding of Jewish culture as well. Can I add uh, one flavor to this discussion about this is it, book? Is it strawberry? No. Oh. But this book also can bring about salvific work in the sense of it shows the character and the uh, work of Jesus Christ, mm. which makes it a part of the canon as well. It's very good. It's one of the things we hadn't talked about yet. A few so things we, are better than strawberry, but yeah, totally. that is, that for sure is. Sorry to derail the authorship, but I'm just thinking about, well, you can also, someone reads this, can, can understand who Jesus is and how they can be saved. So that was an important indicator for early church writing too. I think one of the big things that Hebrews is doing that I think we lose in our modern Western Christianity is that for the first century believer, they're Jewish. Like Paul's Jewish. Jesus is Jewish. Even after the resurrection, you know, Paul's going to synagogue. Like all the disciples are going to synagogue and then they're meeting on the Lord's day, which is Sunday. Um, Paul still submits himself to the leadership of the synagogue. I mean, he's willing to even be um, flogged, right? And so for the first century believer is, okay, well, you have to show me how Jesus is not something altogether new, as though I'm going to walk away from Judaism, but is the fulfillment of everything that I have studied and known and believed and followed. And I think today we just have such a different separation from the two mm-hmm. that the writer of Hebrews is, is helping to take what he knows in the Old Testament, which is an unbelievable grasp and saying, okay, Jesus is the fulfillment and is greater than these other characters mm. so that we attribute our worship to him. That's good. I talked about it just a little bit um, as, a, as a word of caution in Thornton this past week. Uh, the, the point of this, this passage, the way God is speaking, the way God is revealing now through Jesus is greater than anything that has happened before. But, uh, my caution was we don't throw away what happened before. That's right. Like this is the God of the universe who wants to make himself known to his people. Why would we not crave any and all ways that he has revealed himself to us? And so my, my word of, of application throughout this, as we are coming across that vast number of old Testament references, it's to read through Hebrews and then to turn back and read where those passages are coming from. This helps us to, to understand Hebrews better. This helps us to understand our old Testament better, which those are good things but it helps us to understand this God who wants to be known and has made himself known. And we, as his creation, as people who are saved by him, shouldn't we crave any and all ways that he has, he has shown himself to us? Yeah. In that first passage, right? In the first verse where it says, you know, long ago at many times, God spoke to our forefathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son. That doesn't mean like the channel changed or like there's a totally different stream that you yeah. get out of this stream and go to this other stream. It's the clarity that's happening in the sun. There is um, the, 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 I guess the confluence almost like it's all coming together in mm-hmm. Jesus Christ. You don't leave one. You actually see it fulfilled. Um, and so I think that's just really important for us because there are some pastors out there that don't even want you to have a copy of the old Testament. Like it's not even important. Mm-hmm. And it's just not, it's not true. Without the Old Testament, we don't, we don't even grasp who Jesus is. Yeah, exactly right. God spoke through our fathers. He has spoken to us by the Son. It's the same source in yeah. both. And if God is the same yesterday, it's today, and forever, uh, we can trust that the message is going to be the same. But exactly right. It's more clear. It's more complete now in Jesus. Uh, but we should, we should crave any and all ways God has spoken to us. Yeah, speaking of this, and the connection between Hebrews and actually our sermon series in Acts, there's a reference here when we open up Hebrews into Joel 2, and it seemed to be, I'm curious how you guys thought about um, this use in Joel 2 of um, what God was doing through the the works of the Spirit and how that sort of, Im- the implication for today for us, thinking about Hebrews and Acts, want us to really understand that this is not something new, it's something that God has been up to. For our listeners, do you want to clarify what's going on in Joel 2? Uh, yeah, I, I can hop over there. You know, it's um, it's an Old Testament passage and a really obscure Old Testament book that mm-hmm. many of us, you know, don't tend to get to very often unless we're reading through the Bible. But this is what Joel 2 says, and it shall come to pass afterwards, this is Joel 2, 28, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men 
she'll see visions. Um, even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. And in Acts 2, this is what Peter picks up to get himself into his sermon, great sermon that we read. But what did you find out as you study sort of the first part of Hebrews and ran into Joel? Well, I think it's that the, the eschatological shift in God's time of redemption, not like our stopwatch time of Monday through Friday, but in how God is bringing about his plan of salvation. And so the last days, Joel is a reference. There are some indicators of this is the last epoch of time in which God's dealing with humanity. And pouring out his spirit is one of those indicators. Jesus coming is another one. Yeah. Um, death being defeated, sins being forgiven, um, resurrection. Like we live on this side of resurrection. Those are all indicators of this is the characteristics of the last days that people were looking for. And it's, it's upon us. It's here. It's arrived. It's also the characteristics of our faith, like who we are as Christians. We're people that believe Jesus, trust in the resurrection, live in the spirit, all those type of things as well, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. I don't have anything to add. I think that's great. <laughs> yeah. I think one of the, the other pieces in our opening verses was I was talking to a mom after church on Sunday. And she had said, you know, I've studied Hebrews before, and I'm just always so thankful that one of the attributes of Jesus is that he holds all things together. He sustains all things. And I get caught up in trying to hold all things together and sustain all things. And just to be reminded that he's actually the one that sustains me, that he's the one that holds me together. He's the one that can hold this world together, and it's not me in these last days when things seem to be getting shaken. It's just a confidence in who he is um, to be able to navigate some of these last days. So no matter where you find yourself today, no matter where our listeners find themselves today, that's this the truth that we can live in, no matter what that is for each of us, is that Jesus is not only greater, but he holds all things together. Yeah, he's holding it all together. Yeah, and we were talking about it uh, yesterday when we were looking ahead at a few of the passages. I, I think we had this idea again in Hebrews 2, so spoiler alert, don't tell anyone that you've already learned this part, uh, <laughs> listeners. Uh, but in, in Hebrews 2, verse 9, uh, uh, sorry, verse 8, it said uh, that nothing was left outside of his control. Talking about it, everything was put in subjection, how everything was put inside of Jesus' control. Uh, but we don't yet see everything in subjection to him, it says in verse 8. And I think that's true. Like, we can find so much peace and comfort from the fact that in this world that is so crazy and broken, that that nothing falls outside of our good God's control of all things. And yet there are still things that are crazy and broken within it. And I think this is what verse 8 is talking about. Uh, and then it goes on to continue about uh, what what kind of is the comfort in the fact that we don't see everything in subjection to him. What's that he is gone and he has suffered uh, death so that by grace of God he might taste death for everyone. It's yes, this world is still so broken and we don't see everything put under uh, everything's subject, uh, subjection to him, but we do see that the cost that was paid for things to be reconciled, that piece is already paid. And so while we are still wondering what is going on in this world that is broken, we know that the future is set because the price has already been paid through the death and resurrection of Jesus. That's really true. And we get that in this passage as well. It goes straight from he upholds all things, he paid purification for sins, and then he sits on the right hand of the mm-hmm. majesty on high. And and I, th- I think those are lo- put together for the same reason we see it in two. It's Jesus is in control of all things. That might make, uh, we should take comfort from that, but we might have questions of why are still things going this way? Well, Jesus has answer for that as well with the purification of sins, sitting on the right hand of the majesty on high. Yeah, I think that's exactly the comfort that I got out of Sunday. Mm. Um, that confidence of where Jesus sits positionally. Mm. And that he is asking that we actually cry out to him. Yeah. And that he is for us. And, you know, just, gosh, think about the last short season in the world with, if it's Afghanistan, if it's things in New Orleans, if it's fires in California. You know, there are things where you just go, wait, is is this world out of control? And to know that you get to speak to the Lord who sits at the right hand of the Father and he intercedes for you and 
He's given you his spirit. There's such confidence to be able to navigate, which I think is kind of the point of whoever wrote the book to these Jewish Christians in a time that's unsettling, mm. midst of suffering, and the enticement to fall into sin, to comfort themselves maybe. I don't know what that enticement is, but we don't want to fall away from our faith. We don't want to fall into sin and shipwreck our faith. So he's exalting Christ for that purpose because you look around the world and, man, it's hard. It's really, really hard. Yeah. That's for, good. For the last 19 months, I, if, you've, if you've heard me pray out loud, I've, I've talked about the right hand of sitting at the right hand of God with Jesus and declaring that in my prayers because I think that has found... It's where I found the most comfort of my day to day living with Jesus in this crazy time is that the declaration that he, positionally he's in control. He knows what's going on and that I do not and nor do I need to know in order for him to complete his work. Yeah, it's good. It's been encouraging to me. I love these verses. They're so good. The artfulness of them, how well they are written, uh, but not just like how much they impact me, how much they have him back to this church with this verse or with this chapter or the book that we don't know who wrote it. Like these words are still so impactful throughout history. They, I want to just leave with this little reference to the Nicene Creed, this uh, collection of uh, this doctrinal statement that comes from the year 325. And the language just is radiated with Hebrews 1, 1 through 4, it says, We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father, through him all things are made. That is our Jesus, the Jesus who Amen. is greater than anything else. We're going to leave it there. That's great. Great to be with you guys today. Yeah. Hey, go check out CalvaryBible.com. Check out the new landing page for selecting your campus. Also, Get on calvarybible.com slash events. Find out what's going on at your campus. Get plugged in this fall. This is a great fall for you to jump into what God's doing here at Calvary. And just so we get more coffee from the comms team, go to calvarybible.com to get the new church center app too. So you can start your online giving and to search groups that you could possibly jump into this fall. We love you, Calvary. Hope to see you soon. Always write us at the weekly at calvarybible.com. Zach and Thomas respond to those personally so so you know where to send your complaints each week. But we love you. Talk to you very soon.